Immersion is a buzzword in gaming. Developers and publishers tout their games as being immersive, knowing that many consumers crave the escapism that an immersive new world can offer. The word immersive is thrown around as a positive adjective, and in some cases the game being immersive is somehow enough to override other flaws such as a lack of interest in gameplay or story. Personally, I don't seek out games just because they look immersive, however if a game draws me into its world then I definitely consider that a huge positive. Being immersed in new worlds was the reason I got into fantasy books at a young age and why they tended to hook me more than science fiction novels. The first page in a fantasy book is typically a map of an unfamiliar location that will become like a second home over the next 20 plus hours of reading. Within the story, plenty of paragraphs and pages are devoted to explaining the world, the environment and the people who inhabit it. The desire to be immersed in a new world was the reason I first bought Game of Thrones back in 2002 or 2003. I still remember reading a review on Amazon that spoke to how well developed Westeros was thanks to a heavy focus on politics. This was exactly what I was after at the time. Immersion and realism are often conflated. The Song of Ice and Fire series is dark and more realistic than many fantasy series, however high fantasy can also be immersive. For example, pretty much any book by Brandon Sanderson, especially those that form part of the Cosme universe. And then there's Discworld, a world resting on the backs of four elephants that are in turn standing on a giant turtle which is travelling through space. I love the world and characters of Discworld just as much as those of Westeros, although this is cheating a bit because as we know Discworld is a real place, we just haven't discovered it yet. Compare fantasy novels to science fiction ones, which rarely include maps and typically take place over multiple worlds or even entire galaxies. I still enjoy science fiction, and these days I actually read more science fiction than fantasy because I find there's more variation in those stories, however I rarely get as immersed in the world or worlds. There are exceptions of course, and on that note I highly recommend The Expanse series by Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, writing under the pen name James S. A. Corey. Brilliant books. Immersion in video games is tough to describe or categorise. There's an entire genre of games called immersive sims, but I don't find the label overly helpful. It certainly can be used to describe games that immerse you in their world with plenty of history, interesting characters and player focused choices, however just as often it's used as an excuse for games that are otherwise boring and uneventful. Even games from the same series can vary in how immersive they end up being. Regardless of the overall quality of the two games, there's a huge difference between Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite in terms of how immersed I was in the worlds of Rapture and Columbia or Columbo or whatever it was called. Outside of that genre, I've been immersed in games for a variety of reasons. In the case of The Witcher 3, it was mainly the interactions I had with characters throughout my journey. Conversations were believable within the context of the world, and I was easily able to roleplay as Geralt despite him being a fixed character with a largely fixed backstory. I also consider Bloodborne to be an immersive game despite the lack of a story or interesting characters. With a couple of exceptions, the environment has a consistent style that kept me completely engaged in, well, whatever the hell you want to believe is going on based on cryptic comments and item descriptions. Finally, there are games that attempt to immerse you through realism, or at least an approximation of it. Kingdom Come Deliverance is a good recent example of this. You have to eat and sleep regularly, learn to read and keep your clothes clean to impress nobles. I enjoy this aspect of the game despite how incredibly tedious it probably sounds. Other games have similar modes, however they're often linked to the highest difficulty setting available and as such I rarely enjoy them. Fallout 4's survival mode sounds great on paper with the need to sleep, manage radiation exposure and the like, however it's only available on the hardest setting. I'd like to experience the survival option without having to worry about losing 3 hours of gameplay because I got stung by a bee. On the other side, Far Cry 5 has moments where it almost feels like a survival game as you explore cabins and bunkers to collect supplies, except Ubisoft didn't make it anywhere near challenging enough for this to be necessary, and ammo is cheap enough to buy that you won't need to explore if you don't want to. It's important not to confuse immersion and realism. Going back to Kingdom Come Deliverance, moving your inventory from your horse to your character before you sell it might be realistic, however it's a pain in the arse. Likewise, it's realistic to struggle in a sword fight when against three people, but that doesn't mean it isn't a terrible fighting system that encourages you to cheese your way through fights by getting enemies to line up or shoot each other with arrows. All this is to say that immersive is often thrown around as a de facto positive description of a game, yet in my opinion it isn't enough to make a game great. Metro 2033 nails immersion better than most games I've played in the last 10 years. It might even be the most immersive. Metro 2033 is a scattering of flaws that detract enough from the experience that I don't consider it to be a must buy, more like a should try. It reminds me a bit of my experience with The Evil Within. I found that to be quite a flawed game and yet it got me really interested in the sequel. This is where I usually tell you that there is a written review of the game on my website and what score I gave it. I'm not going to do that for Metro 2033. I bought 2033 as part of Metro Redux, which is a collection of both Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light. While you can buy the game separately, it feels a bit disingenuous to review them that way when I bought the package. Also the way the pricing works out, I can't imagine many people bought one of the games separately unless they already own the other. I paid about $7 for the collection when the two were available for $5 each. I'll review the bundle when I've played both games. 
To help you keep the rest of this video in context, I will say that if I did review Metro 2033, it'd probably be a four out of five, or perhaps a three with a strong recommendation that you give it a shot if linear 10 hour survival games are your cup of tea. As noted in the title, I'm focusing on the Redux version of Metro 2033, which has improved visuals on console and some gameplay changes from the sequel Last Light that were brought back to this version. I didn't play the original and don't intend to spend much time talking about the differences between the two, except for the inclusion of a new Spartan playstyle that I will discuss in some detail. Other than that, there are some changes to voice actors, levels have been combined to have fewer breaks, and stealth takedowns are now much easier. There will be full story spoilers from this point on. If you are considering picking up the game, just stop watching, although I don't think spoilers will ruin the experience in this case. As you may know, Metro 2033 is based on the novel Metro 2033 by Dmitry Glukowski. For some reason, the novel isn't available in ebook format in the US, however, the audiobook is, so that's how I read it, so to speak. This video will also have spoilers for the book. I don't intend to go into a lot of depth, however, I will highlight some key differences, and that includes the ending. From gameplay footage, Metro 2033 looks like a typical linear FPS with some light resource management. In fact, it likely looks rather bland with only two environments of note, the insides of metro tunnels and the snowy exterior of the irradiated surface. That's certainly how it looked to me on release, and it wasn't until I saw the Redux collection on sale for a ridiculously cheap price that I decided to take a punt on it. I'm glad I did. I can't speak for Last Light yet, however Metro 2033 had some incredible high points that more than made up for tedious moments like turret sections and an over-reliance on the Salis ambushes to mix up the pacing. As I mentioned, Metro 2033 is immersive. It achieves this through its environment and mechanics as opposed to characters and storytelling. It's a bit like mixing what I found immersive about Bloodborne and Kingdom Come Deliverance. I was immediately sucked in by the suffocating and dark metro tunnels which contrasted with the open and bright surface areas, although both are equally depressing in their own way. As you may have guessed, Metro 2033 takes place in the year 2033, 20 years after the bombs first dropped in World War III. Moscow quickly became unlivable due to nuclear fallout. Around 40,000 people fled to underground metro stations, including young Artyom and his mother. From the book, we know that Artyom's mother died when their station was invaded by a group of large rats. I'm assuming the cause of death in the game is the same, as it was never directly contradicted. Artyom lives in a station called Vidinyanka, although the game mainly refers to it as Exhibition, which is a reference to a nearby Russian exhibition on the surface. From the book, we know that Exhibition Station was known for its mushroom tea, which, while not really tasting anything like actual tea, quickly became a popular drink with traders from other stations. The game introduces mushroom vodka, and we also see the pigs that are raised here. Exhibition feels like a place that people have made into a home. It's not a happy place, but it is a place you can imagine people surviving in, especially when you account for the trading that took place between stations. Unfortunately, you can't interact with other people all that much, which is why I found the environment more immersive than the characters. That said, the crowded rooms of people hustling around with miserable looks on their faces as they try to eke out an existence goes further than most games to make you feel like this is a real post-apocalyptic nightmare. Stations are locked up tight to prevent attacks from the Salis, mutated versions of moles, I think. Nosalis are a constant threat, finding their way into stations through air ducts and attacking in large numbers. Nosalis are a pain, but this tunnel trash can be dealt with. The new and more troublesome threat is the Dark Ones. The Dark Ones are also referred to as Homo Novos, the next step in the evolution of humanity. Alex, a father figure to Artyom, sees these Dark Ones as the future and is ready to give up the fight. The way he sees it, humanity as it once was will soon cease to exist. A man named Hunter, more a description than his actual name, isn't ready to give up the fight. He goes out to find the Dark Ones, but not before giving Artyom a mission. Hunter tells Artyom that if he doesn't return, Artyom must go to Polis to warn Miller about the imminent threat the Dark Ones pose to Exhibition and the rest of the Metro system. And for much of the game, that's it. Your entire mission is to get to Polis. This simple introduction quickly drew me into the world of Metro 2033, but it's the little touches that are to blame for me using the words immersive and immersion about 367 times during this video. The best illustration of a small feature being great for the overall experience is the humble gas mask. Artyom needs to wear a gas mask above ground, and as such, you'll need to look after the one you're wearing. The gas mask breaks if you take too many hits during combat. You'll see the damage on the mask and the cracks will obscure your view. You can swap your mask for a new one if you find one in a locker or on a dead body. Splashes of blood occasionally cover the mask, but you can get rid of them with a quick swipe. The mask needs air filters, and depending on what difficulty you're playing and what mode, these might be in short supply. You have to change air filters every five minutes. When there's only one minute left on the filter, Artyom's breathing becomes laboured, which increases your chances of being heard by guards. If the air filter expires, Artyom dies. In addition to the gas mask, Artyom has a torch, which he has to keep powered up through a battery that he can pump to recharge. If the battery is low, then the light dims until it eventually stops working. 
You don't have to recharge the battery often, just remember to keep an eye on it so that the light doesn't fade at an inopportune time. Certain weapons also need to be recharged to keep them in optimal condition, and as you can imagine, this is certainly not something you want to leave for the middle of a combat encounter. Again, I'm sure it sounds tedious, and technically it is, however you don't do it so often that it feels like a needless chore or a gimmick. It feels like a genuine part of maintaining a stockpile of weapons that are long past their prime. The guns jam up on very rare occasions. It's not predictable or frequent like, for example, a massive sword breaking after 5 minutes of light use. Metro 2033's system feels more akin to maintaining your weapons in Kingdom Come Deliverance. A bit of a nuisance perhaps, but more important to the experience than you might appreciate if you haven't played the game. Some guns take a long time to fully reload. This would normally bug me, however it doesn't here, and I think that's because Artyom isn't being sluggish. He's actually moving fairly quickly when he reloads, however due to the antiquated nature of the weapons it takes a long time. It also helps that the guns feel incredible to use. Weapons like the shotgun have a real heft to them, whereas the air gun feels suitably pathetic even if it is deadly with headshots. The only weapon I didn't particularly like was the starting revolver which looks way too small in Artyom's hand. You also have a watch that displays how much time you have left on your current air filter and an indicator that glows blue when you're standing in light and are therefore visible to enemies. You won't be glued to any mini-maps or constantly managing your inventory. Nearly all the information you need is displayed through your character or the tools he carries. Even directions are subtly signposted through arrows on the wall that look like a natural part of the scenery. In one short level you have to escort a child back to his mother. I feel much the same way about escort missions as you probably do, but this one isn't too bad. The kid jumps on your back so you don't have to worry about keeping him safe as such. He's even vaguely helpful, shouting out directions when there are enemies approaching. You do, however, have to deal with the effect he has on your momentum and speed as you move. You feel like you're carrying a child on your back. It's harder to aim and shoot as well. Likewise, if you're outside in the middle of a strong wind, you can expect your aim to sway all over the place. The wind isn't a constant irritation. It dips in and out every few seconds, which helps it feel like a genuine struggle against the elements instead of just being that level's feature that will soon be discarded. Even the in-game economy helps keep you immersed. Every hour or so you'll get the chance to buy or sell ammo, grenades, knives and med packs and upgrade your weapons. The currency you use for all this is a special type of ammo called military grade rounds or MGR. You occasionally get given MGR but for the most part you need to find it out in the world. So far it's much like a normal currency, however there's a crucial difference. You can use the currency in combat and I don't just mean throwing it around to distract enemies. In the world of Metro 2033 the regular ammo used for combat is inferior to military grade rounds. The regular ammo was made after the start of the war and is referred to as dirty rounds, whereas the MGR is high quality ammo from before the start of the war. The military grade rounds are a limited supply and therefore appropriate for a form of currency. I love this system. The poorer quality ammo is less accurate and does less damage to enemies. If you run out of dirty rounds or are struggling with a particularly challenging fight then you might be tempted to use your MGR, in which case you'll literally be firing money at enemies. It's a brilliant mechanic and when playing on the harder settings where resources are more restrictive, each bullet that leaves your gun hurts you as much as it does the person on the receiving end. Even on easier settings when I'd spent all the money I needed to spend, I was still reluctant to shoot my MGR in case it would be more useful in a later encounter. Immersion is a lot like trust, it takes a hell of a lot of work to gain and is easily lost. Metro 2033 works hard to keep you immersed, but in both of my main playthroughs I ended up drifting out of the world by the end. Strangely the reasons for this were similar and yet opposite. In my first playthrough resources were almost comically plentiful. By around the halfway point I had the three weapons best suited to my style and all the upgrades I wanted. From there on out scavenging for supplies lost much of its luster. I kept hunting around in lockers to find journals but the suspense and excitement of finding a new air filter was completely lost. I had to leave supplies behind because I was already fully stocked. The obvious answer to that problem is to up the difficulty which is what I did on my second playthrough. That made a big difference until the final few hours when once again the illusion shattered. Near the end of the game you reach Polis Station and tell its ruling council about the threat of the Dark Ones. The council debates and eventually decides not to help you. Miller mentions a missile silo that's currently offline but could be roped back into use to bomb the Dark Ones. At this point you're given a free choice of weapons and upgrades to use so you only need to worry about a supply of ammo and air filters. In my case I had ammo but was low on air filters. I scrounged around desperate for every extra minute of air I could find. If I'd been by myself this would have been tense and challenging but strangely enjoyable. However, I wasn't alone. I had three or four other people with me and I had a seemingly endless supply of air filters. This wouldn't have been immersion breaking if it weren't for the fact that my comrades regularly wasted time by casually joking around and taking their sweet time to get me out of locked rooms. Don't go anywhere. We'll come for you on our way back. <laughs> they were blissfully unaware that I was one minute from death and it was a touch frustrating. 
Likewise, a slow elevator ride was a lot tenser for me than it was for my compatriot. In one section, I ignored my teammates who needed help fighting a demon and ran away until I triggered the end of the chapter. I missed that on a cutscene, but at least I survived. This is only really a problem in the last couple of levels, which were slow and on rails. A few times I was hanging on to just a few seconds of air and thought I'd trap myself in an unwinnable situation. Fortunately, 4A games must have recognised the issue because I soon came across plenty of air filters. In the end, I got through comfortably. Other players might not have found this a problem at all, or if they did, it might not have ruined immersion, but it was an issue for me. That this is one of the few times Metro 2033 took me out of its carefully crafted world should speak highly to what is an otherwise solid experience. Metro stealth gameplay is another element that aids with immersion while also being responsible for tearing you out with it on a semi-regular basis. As you might expect, our team often needs to stay quiet and out of sight. You often sneak around doing melee takedowns from behind or taking pot shots with a silent pistol. Unlike many other stealth games, the staying out of sight part is nearly entirely dependent on staying in the dark as opposed to staying out of the enemy's line of sight. If you want to be sneaky, it's crucial to turn off all the lights, put out the fires and shoot the lights you can't reach. Darkness is your friend. This can feel incredible. Gradually turning off the lights one by one and then either killing enemies or ghosting past them is pretty damn satisfying. It's not necessarily as easy as it sounds either. You can't use your torch to see where you're going because that would obviously negate the whole turning off the lights thing. Many of the locations have tripwires that are genuinely hard to spot even with a light let alone in the dark. Enemies also set up traps and hang cans from the ceiling which make a noise when you walk into them. In other words, you have to be incredibly careful. Kind of. You see, Metro 2033's enemies manage to be both fairly stupid and remarkably perceptive. If you're in the dark, you are for all intents and purposes invisible. You can literally stand right in front of enemies and they won't notice you. Being out of the light doesn't just make you harder to see, it makes you nigh on impossible to see. Unless that is you make certain noises such as firing an unsuppressed gun or hitting one of the cans. Then every enemy in the level immediately knows where you are as if they are all psychically linked to that one can. This doesn't apply to all noises though. When you perform so-called silent takedowns, the enemies let out a scream just before you slit their throat. It's especially distracting because the scream usually comes after you've killed them. Bitch. All this leads to a stealth experience that can feel incredibly tense and, yes, immersive, however it all breaks apart at the seams once you figure out its fairly basic limitations. Regardless of its issues, stealth is the best way to play the game by a long shot. Each level has a stealth option that's great for taking enemies down silently, and in fact it typically has an even stealthier option where you can make it through without needing to kill anyone. In fact, many of the levels are so stealthy by default that you can easily miss the opportunity to be even stealthier because you assume you already are taking the stealth option. Take the level where you have to make it past the conflict between the communists of the Red Line and the Nazis of the Fourth Reich. If you're wondering where the hell the Nazis came from, then don't worry, I'll get to that later. You need to make it to the other side of this tunnel. Directly in front of you are the Reds who have just brought a fresh batch of troops to the front line. Beyond the Reds are the Nazis. The Nazis shout their propaganda towards the Reds, insisting that they never use torture and that life really is better on their side. Both sides are shooting at each other, but you never see a huge battle. It's like shelling the trenches in preparation to enter no man's land. On my first playthrough, I had no intention of going straight down the middle of this war zone. That wouldn't have been particularly safe or stealthy. I took a path to the left, killed a couple of guards and then a couple more to rescue a hostage. Some white arrows hinted at the way forward using the pipes to traverse underneath much of the action until I came back up near the end. There were more guards that could be killed from the shadows or you could use the massive machine gun. After this there's a tunnel and the level moves into another section where you can also take hidden routes by sticking to the side tunnels while trying to avoid a rail car with a turret. It wasn't until I came back to this level on a second playthrough that I realised going straight through the war zone wasn't an option anyway. It's blocked off. The route I took the first time was the intended route and there's an even stealthier option available by dropping down to the ground floor. It didn't help that the first time I dropped down here it resulted in instant death from a fall that didn't seem all that bad, making me think the area was out of reach. It's not. There's a lot of trip wires down here, but if you make your way to the end you can avoid combat entirely and even rescue people being held hostage by the Nazis. Doing this completely avoids the heavily armoured railcar and well over 10 enemies. Even in levels where direct combat is presented as an option, assuming you can survive, staying in the shadows is clearly the preferred way to play. An early level illustrates this perfectly. Artyom is travelling with a man named Bourbon. Bourbon is captured, however, Artyom manages to remain hidden. There are a lot of enemies in this section, so I instinctively tried to move forward using stealth takedowns where necessary to clear a path. You can take numerous routes through, some more successful than others. Once again, even without putting in a conscious effort, you'll likely sneak your way past a decent chunk of this level, even if you don't discover the optimal route until a second playthrough.
However, the really interesting part about this level is not the enemies that you kill, but the ones killed by a mystery figure. It's quite creepy to be planning a takedown on an enemy, only to see them go down with a knife in their back that you didn't throw. This saved me from getting caught on a few occasions. Now let's imagine you were going in all guns blazing, lobbing grenades in every direction and spending all that glorious bullet currency. Would you even notice this guy helping you? I'll never know for sure because that's not the approach I took on my first playthrough, however I suspect not. Without this stranger, a man named Khan, helping you from the shadows, this level is forgettable. Instead, when he pops out of a vent at the end of the level, you meet someone you can immediately trust. I can't imagine this will be anywhere near as impactful if you just charge through the level to get to the end. All this is to say that Metro 2033 is a stealth game, first and foremost. Even when you aren't going to any special effort to take quieter routes through levels, you will likely do so anyway. There are plenty of stealth mechanics such as moving bodies, turning off lights and a constant indicator of when you are visible to enemies. You're also fairly weak. On the normal setting you have regenerating health in addition to med packs, however you can still go down quickly under fire. On the higher settings you don't have regenerating health and ammo is relatively scarce, so taking out enemies with a headshot or melee takedown is preferable. Other mechanics such as the aforementioned one where you are helped from the shadows by Khan also add to the feeling that 4A Games wanted you to treat Metro 2033 as a stealth experience in addition to a survival one. It's also far more fun this way because I don't think the shooting feels all that great but that's far too subjective for me to prove. It just feels sluggish in a way that reminds me of the original Killzone and Resistance games. So 4A Games set out to make a stealth game. They made a stealth game and stealth is the most rewarding way to play the game. Mission accomplished, right? It's not a trick question, 4A Games did a good job with the original release. Why then did it add Spartan mode in the Redux version? Before talking about Spartan mode it's worth looking at all the other modes and options for playing Metro 2033 because there are a lot of them. I can't remember the last time I was presented with so many different ways to play a game. It's an important choice too, but the decision you make for mode and difficulty will impact your experience more than any other. It's a sorry state of affairs that the second most memorable aspect of what is otherwise a strong game is the time I spent on the options screen before even starting my first playthrough. I nearly always play games on normal difficulty initially as I feel it gives the best representation of how the developers intended the game to be played. That's not always the best way or the way most suited to my style but it's usually a good starting point. As appropriate on subsequent playthroughs I will try out harder settings and occasionally easier ones if they offer up different experiences such as Near Automata. In Metro 2033 and specifically in the Redux version trying to figure out which option is the intended experience is a challenge in and of itself. This is slightly tedious to go through but I believe it's important to the analysis. On its original release Metro 2033 contained two modes each with two difficulty settings so you had four options in total. You could play the standard version of the game in either normal or hardcore difficulties or play the ranger mode again in either normal or hardcore. I'll explain this all more in a minute. The Redux introduced a new way to play Metro 2033 known as Spartan. The previous four options I described a minute ago are now categorised under the survival playstyle. Spartan mode is a new playstyle that lets you play Metro 2033 with what it describes as the more forgiving combat of Last Light. It is supposedly more suitable for action oriented gamers and contains more ammo and resources. Under the Spartan option you can play either normal, hardcore, ranger or ranger hardcore. For those keeping count at home that's a total of 8 options to choose from the start. I initially wondered whether I should start with Spartan mode. Presumably if the developers went back and added in options from the sequel that would be the best way to play the older game right? Like a director's cut of a movie should be the director's vision of what the movie should have been all along. After completing the game in both survival and Spartan styles I can say almost definitively that survival is the intended playstyle. Spartan wasn't added as some sort of director's cut or preferred vision. It's more an optional alternative like bonus content. At least that's how it feels to me and there is some evidence to support this. Survival normal is not terribly difficult. I'd say it's surprisingly easy so long as you make half an effort to search for supplies. I suppose if you just power through then you might end up short of filters or ammo but it's unlikely. It won't shock you to hear that hardcore mode is harder. You have less health, enemies have more health and there's less ammo. It's a relatively straightforward change in numbers that doesn't make much difference to how you play the game. You'll die more and get fewer second chances if you happen to be caught but you know what to expect from a mode like this. Survival ranger mode is where things get interesting. Ranger mode makes two key changes. Both changes make the experience better and more immersive however there are some crucial caveats that mean I can't necessarily recommend this for a first playthrough which is a shame as otherwise it's the ideal way to play. In ranger mode we're told that resources are scarcer. I don't know whether this is when compared to normal mode or hardcore mode. I think it's compared to normal but it's hard to prove. You have less health however the crucial part is that so do the enemies. 
This is one of those times that attempts at realism and immersion merge quite nicely because I've never been a huge fan of human bullet sponge enemies. I don't mind a bit of additional armor here and there, but there should be reasonable limits and no human should be shrugging off headshots without a helmet. The other major changes are to the HUD and UI. Hints are disabled, although you can turn them back on again in the menu. The lack of a HUD certainly sounds great for immersion. Once you know you can turn off certain lights and put out fires, you don't need a big prompt popping up on the screen every time you look at them. Likewise, you won't get pickup prompts on lockers, enemies, ammo stashes, or trip wires. You also aren't prompted to perform melee takedowns, although there's a subtle controller vibration to let you know when you're close enough. This can be confusing on a first playthrough. Some of the lockers you can open don't look all that distinct from the ones you can't, and you end up hitting the pickup prompt on enemies multiple times even when there's nothing left to get, just in case. There's not even a prompt for talking to people like vendors. I understand the desire for immersion, however, talking to a vendor brings up a HUD that takes up most of the screen anyway. This is much more distracting than a small icon that indicates who you can interact with. On survival ranger mode, you still get the HUD when you want to change throwable weapons or change your air filters, take off your gas mask, recharge your weapons, etc. You also still get the smaller prompts when you need to interact with a control panel or door. On survival ranger hardcore, you don't get any of the HUD come up, even the one that lets you change throwable weapons, turn on your torch and the like. This means you have to memorize exactly which buttons are used for each feature. If you've already played this game once, this isn't a huge problem, although I would still forget which button to press for regular grenades versus fire grenades. Without a doubt, the most annoying part of having no HUD is the inability to see how much ammo you're carrying and how much you pick up. You can usually tell how much ammo is in your gun just by looking at it. This is great and exactly the kind of thing I appreciate. However, what I'm not so keen on is being completely clueless as to how much ammo I'm carrying. There's no way to look down at your body to see the spare clips. You might have a full cartridge in the gun, but you'll have no idea if that represents the last of your ammo or is just one clip from many. You can't keep track of ammo in your head as it doesn't tell you how much you get when you pick it up. On PS4, by holding triangle, you can see how many military grade rounds you have available for spending or for using as bullets. That's in Ranger mode. In Ranger Hardcore, you don't even get this screen. It's odd that the total stock of ammo isn't displayed here. There's already a huge pop-up on the screen, might as well add some more information to it. I've seen this defended with the usual realism argument, but it doesn't hold up. I should be able to check how many clips I'm carrying if I want, regardless of the desire to minimize HUD elements. I really enjoyed Survival Ranger and Survival Ranger Hardcore modes, and if it weren't for the lack of a HUD, I would have no hesitation recommending either for a first playthrough. Scarce resources, together with both the protagonist and the enemies being weak, is a great fit for Metro 2033's stealth gameplay and immersive experience. I just wish the decision for what's displayed on the HUD had been left up to the player. Maybe the HUD could be on by default with a subtle recommendation to turn it off after an hour or so. As it stands, I found myself in the slightly opposite position of recommending new players start on Survival Normal or Survival Hardcore, play for a few hours to get a feel for the game, and then start from scratch in Survival Ranger or Survival Ranger Hardcore mode. That's a pretty convoluted and unsatisfying recommendation and not a great way to get players into the game. And I'm only halfway through Metro 2033's game modes because I still have to discuss the new Spartan setting. As I mentioned, the Spartan mode wasn't included in the initial release. It's described as bringing the gunplay from Last Light to Metro 2033. If that's the case, I may not like Last Light all that much. However, I suspect my disappointment with the Spartan mode here is more about trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Spartan mode is more action oriented, but it has the same four choices as before. You can play Normal, Hardcore, Ranger, or Ranger Hardcore. I didn't play much of the Normal and Hardcore modes here. Resources did appear to be more plentiful than the comparable survival modes and our team can take more damage. However, I still had a tendency to choose stealth options when available because the gunplay just doesn't feel all that good. Even with the sensitivity up high, our team is slow both in movement and aiming, so you quickly get outnumbered and surrounded. Neither normal or hardcore feels like a good option. In normal, it's quite easy just to bumble your way through with all the accuracy of Dick Cheney after a couple of drinks, and it isn't particularly fun. The best way I can describe it is functional. You use cover when required, point your gun, shoot and repeat. There's no athleticism and little danger. If someone were to play Metro 2033 on Spartan Normal, they probably won't remember the game for five minutes after completing it. It's just forgettable. Spartan Hardcore is of course harder, but this is where the lack of mobility becomes frustrating. In this mode, I found myself playing it as a full-on cover shooter instead of a stealth game or action FPS. I don't recommend either of the standard Spartan game modes, but what about the Ranger modes? Once again, we're told that Ranger and Ranger Hardcore modes have less ammo and resources, plus both Artyom and enemies take fewer shots to kill. The problem is, compared to what? Compared to the normal Spartan settings? If so, how does this work? Spartan mode supposedly turns Metro into more of a shooter with more resources and health. Ranger mode then decreases the resources and Artyom's health. So do those changes cancel each other out? Do you have more health and ammo on, say, Spartan Ranger than Survival Normal? 
How should you play Spartan Ranger mode anyway? Is it still supposed to be played as a shooter with a more action focus, or should you go full stealth again? If so, how is this really any different to Survival Ranger? By the time I tried all the difficulties and modes, I spent too much time playing Metro 2033 to say for sure which was harder, because my own knowledge of the game was increasing. You can only keep one save file and you can't change the difficulty on the fly, so it's tough to run good comparisons short of playing the game through 8 times. What I can say is that the Ranger modes on Spartan felt a hell of a lot like the Ranger modes on Survival. I honestly couldn't tell any difference. Spartan Ranger felt like a stealth game with scarce resources and just enough challenge to keep up the tension throughout. It certainly didn't feel like an action FPS. I made a conscious decision to go without a silenced pistol on this playthrough because I knew I would end up relying on it, which in turn would make me play the game stealthily again. But even without the pistol, I still found myself keeping to the shadows and trying my best to remain unseen. And I tried, I really tried, however there just seemed to be some sections that I couldn't possibly get through without avoiding combat entirely. Take for example this level where you have to get past a bunch of Nazis on the surface while braving a harsh wind and demon attacks from the sky. Initially I tried to sneak past the Nazis while they were dealing with a the demon. There was plenty of wind to cover any noise I made, however a searchlight at the far end kept catching me and suddenly all the Nazis would forget about the demon and go straight for me. I then tried shooting the light out from afar, however without a silenced weapon this would always draw attention. Again, I would wait until a demon was attacking and assume the sound of my weapon was covered by all the other gunfire, but no such luck. I was far too weak to deal with all these guys, so I tried running past them but got shot down in seconds. Eventually I fumbled my way to the end. I didn't do anything special, I didn't learn anything, I just got lucky. With a silenced pistol this section isn't a huge problem, but sticking to the supposed gun-toting Spartan mode doesn't work. There was zero satisfaction to overcoming this challenge because I'm not convinced I overcame anything, and I'm not convinced it was a fair challenge anyway. Spartan mode was an afterthought, literally, I mean that's not me speculating, it obviously was an afterthought as it wasn't in the original game and was only added in the Redux. This means that certain levels or sections within levels don't feel like a good fit for the change in playstyle. You can't just add more health and ammo to change a game, especially if you then have a mode that takes the health and ammo away again. I don't recommend playing Spartan mode at all unless you are really desperate for the trophy or achievement. And who would go to extreme lengths just for a trophy? There are a couple of other minor differences between the modes. One worth mentioning is that in all the ranger modes you can only carry two weapons instead of three. Only having two weapons at any time also changes the economy slightly. You can concentrate on upgrading only two weapons and you'll be able to sell all the ammo types you collect but don't use. Ranger mode also reduces the maximum amount of ammo you can carry, so even if you explore methodically you still might find yourself running out of bullets when fending off Marsalis. On balance I recommend just one playthrough. Take your time, soak in the story and read all the journal entries. There's a lot more to Metro 2033 than you'd think from a story that just has you travelling from one metro station to another. As I mentioned I don't want to move through the story beat by beat, however there are some parts I'd like to discuss in more detail. I've already discussed Artyom's home station briefly, with its focus on pigs and mushrooms to create enough food and drink to survive. The stations all have different areas of expertise and philosophies, but they have one thing in common. They are all depressing places. You won't see many smiles on your travels, and entertainment seems to consist of old dudes playing musical instruments badly, telling stories and the odd shadow puppet show. Not everyone in the metro even has it that good. There are beggars dotted around and long lines to receive medical treatment. Every station has this oppressive air about it. They're crowded and claustrophobic and absolutely the sort of place you would only live if everywhere else was a nuclear wasteland. These stations all feel like places where men live, work and fight. Unfortunately I have to use the qualifier men because it's not entirely clear where all the women are. I saw a few dotted around but not all that many, I think I saw more children than women. In the world of Metro 2033 the men do all the fighting, so to the extent you are in heavily guarded parts of the station it does sort of make sense that you'd mainly see men. I say sort of because I'm fairly sure even the most misogynistic of men would let women join them in the fight against the Nosalis and whatever else is roaming the tunnels. That's a bigger conversation I don't want to get into here because we aren't given much in the way of information. In order to create some logical consistency in my head I decided to assume that a conscious decision was made to keep women off the front line because they're necessary for the survival of the human race. If the women die there are no children, if there are no children there are no more future soldiers. That said there aren't all that many children running around either so yeah I'm not too sure about that one. Even with this somewhat flimsy excuse in my head it's still a shame that the metro stations are so male dominated because it means there's little diversity in terms of character models. With most of the men being white and in similar uniforms there's a tendency for them to all blur into one. I also suspect that voice actors perform numerous roles because the voices all sound incredibly similar. That could just be me not having a good ear when it comes to the Russian accent so I definitely had trouble distinguishing between the people I met on my journey. A few women would have helped keep things more interesting and I found the obvious lack of them distracting. I've spoken about Artyom's home station as if that's where you start the game, however there is actually a prologue which takes place 8 days in the future. 
Artyom and Miller, the man Hunter asked you to find, head up to the surface and fight off waves of Nasalis until the screen fades to black. This introduction appears fairly innocuous at first glance, and yet I found myself disproportionately annoyed at it. The book doesn't start with this prologue, so I assume it was a concession made by the developers to get players into the action earlier. 4A Games might have been worried that spending a couple of hours in dark tunnels would have been boring for players, and put this section in to let you know that at some point you will escape the darkness. Not only was this not necessary, it was detrimental to the experience. It wasn't necessary because Metro 2033 isn't a particularly long game and there's plenty of combat in the tunnels for players to get stuck into early on. I can't imagine many people picking up a game with Metro in the title and then being disappointed that the first hour or so took place in a Metro system. It's also a weird touch when you reach this station for real later on in the game and have a different set of weapons at your disposal. However, the bigger problem is that going to the surface is your very first act in the game spoils what should be a big moment later on. Artyom was born on the surface, however he hasn't been back since he was a young child. He has faint memories of being happy and living in a beautiful city, but he doesn't know what it's like on the surface now. Neither do we as the player. The surface is a mystery, or at least it should be. Instead of spending a few hours wondering what's happened to Moscow in the 20 years since the war began, the prologue tells us right up front. There's plenty of intrigue to keep players interested without the need for this prologue. We're quickly introduced to the impending threat of the Dark Ones when Alex tells us they will end the human race as we know it, and Hunter goes on his suicide mission to fight them. Metro 2033 might start slow, but I wouldn't describe it as boring. Artyom's introduction to these mysterious Dark Ones comes via a vision. Artyom is in a cart with three other people when everyone starts tripping out as an electrical spark known as an anomaly flickers in the background. Artyom appears to lose consciousness and sees a Dark One in his dream. The Dark One is about to grab him before changing his mind and walking away. Artyom comes to and wakes up the guy next to him with a quick shake of his shoulder. The other two don't wake up and are killed by the Nasalis. When you make it to safety, Artyom is held as some sort of hero for being able to resist the Dark Ones. In the game, this doesn't make a lot of sense. After all, our companion was able to wake up easily enough, albeit we did give him a nudge. Still, it doesn't seem like there's anything particularly special about Artyom from this, nor much of what follows. He does have a special link with the Dark Ones, I just wish this had been presented a little clearer. Perhaps Artyom could have been the only one to wake up at all in this scene. On a similar note, the threat itself isn't all that clear. Hunter tells us that the Dark Ones are a threat, but we don't see them acting in a particularly threatening manner. One of the Dark Ones appears to attack a soldier in Artyom's vision, but it can't have been a particularly deadly attack because the soldier shoots the Dark One as it walks away. Artyom has more of these visions as we progress, and none of them ever made me feel particularly scared of the Dark Ones. There's a reason for that, which I'll get to soon, however I'd still argue that the Dark One should have been made out to be much more threatening without changing the story. The bigger and more immediate threat to Artyom comes in the form of the Communists of the Red Line and the Nazis of the Fourth Reich. These Nazis are Russian, not German, but they are very much inspired by Adolf Hitler. Post-nuclear war, the concept of racial purity has extended into genetic purity. Not only did the Nazis consider non-whites to be inferior, they also looked down on those with bodily imperfections. The Nazis want to stop the spread of anything they see as a mutation, and will therefore happily execute someone for the crime of having a missing finger, even if it was lost in combat. It's slightly odd to play a game where Nazis are just another enemy as opposed to the main enemy. Nazis are the big threat for a few levels, however so are the Reds, and the most dangerous threats often come in the form of mutated animals like Nosalis, demons or librarians. The librarians, so called because you find them in the library, are excellent foes. I believe they are mutated apes, although Artyom wonders whether they might once have been human. They hunt you down, often leaping at you from holes in the ceiling or floor. Librarians are damn tough to kill if you don't have anything flammable to hand, however they will back away if you stop and stare them in the eyes. So, the Nazis are not the most memorable foes you face. That would normally be a criticism. There has to be something missing if I face off against Nazis and find them largely indistinct from the rest of the human enemies. In this case, I'm fairly sure it's intentional. In one of his diary entries, Artyom remarks that while the Red Line and the Fourth Reich should be polar opposites politically, they both have a starving populace and use forced labour. The remarkable thing about the Nazis of Metro 2033 is that they aren't all that remarkable, and that's horrifying. Artyom eventually reaches Polis. He finds Miller, who in turn tells the Council of the danger facing Exhibition Station. After a debate, the Council refuses to help Exhibition, and it looks like Artyom's journey was a waste of time. Ultimately, Miller and a few of his colleagues agree to take matters into their own hands. Together they go to the surface to find the location of a missile silo referred to as D6, which is where we end up looping back into the prologue. Artyom and company prepare a missile to hit the location of the Dark Ones. It seems a bit weird that the Dark Ones are all huddled together in one location, however we still don't know much about them. The final chapter has Artyom climbing a tower to get the transmitter up high enough for a signal. Artyom reaches the top, turns on the transmitter, and the game ends as the missiles hit the Dark Ones, supposedly wiping them out permanently.
This ending didn't quite land for me. As I mentioned earlier, the Dark Ones never appeared to be much of a threat, so victory over them felt a little hollow. And is it really likely that the next step in human evolution will happen to be in one relatively small place? I'm guessing they haven't actually been wiped out, and I hope to see more of them in Last Light or Exodus. The book handles the ending better. It's the same broad concept, except there's a twist. Artyom eventually realises that Dark Ones aren't a threat at all. They're trying to help. They've been reaching out to Artyom as he is the only one they're able to communicate with. By the time Artyom realises this, it's too late. In other words, the conclusion is the same, the Dark Ones get blown up. Except in the game, you're thinking your actions helped win the battle, whereas in the book, it feels like Artyom might have lost the war. This distinction isn't a change between the game and the book. In both versions, the Dark Ones are trying to help humanity. The difference is that in the game, we only find this out via an alternative ending that I suspect many people miss. The second ending is achieved by becoming enlightened through one of the weirdest morality systems I've experienced in a while. Morality systems in any genre outside of RPGs tend to be rather one note and require you as the player to do some fairly ridiculous things to achieve the bad ending. It often doesn't fit well with the main story or what we know about the character from cutscenes. The infamous games are culprits that come to mind, however there are plenty of others. Metro 2033's system is different. The ending where Artyom blows up the Dark Ones before finding out that they were trying to help is both the bad ending and the canon ending. It's also likely to be the ending that most people see. Reaching the good ending doesn't require you to follow a set of obvious choices such as do you give money to a beggar or chop off his head for having the nerve to ask. The game never explains this morality system to you so I dived into wikis to uncover the details. Even then I couldn't find out how many of these morality points you need to trigger the good ending. There are plenty of points available however you can lose some through negative actions like allowing prisoners to be executed. I'm referring to them as morality points however it's not just about being a good person. Some morality points are gained by giving money to children and beggars when they ask for it, however you also get them for listening to noises in a pipe, remaining undetected in certain sections, and finding hidden stashes. You even get them for strumming a musical instrument or two. Strangely, you don't get them for knocking people unconscious instead of killing them, nor do you lose points for doing the opposite. The only way you know you've received a morality point is a quick blue flicker on the screen and the sound of dripping water. This is easily missable, especially when you're in a tunnel with varying light sources and external sounds. I played through the entire game without noticing it. I do like the idea of a hidden morality system that judges you for small actions without you being aware of it. The trophy or achievement for reaching the good ending is referred to as enlightened, and many of the morality points are for being inquisitive as opposed to simply good. In the enlightened ending, Artyom realises that the Dark Ones are not trying to kill humans at all. The Dark Ones have been trying to help you all along. We see that it wasn't the Dark Ones who killed Hunter's group at the beginning, it was the Nosalis. This is a weird ending, as apart from a very quick glimpse at the start of the game, we barely saw anything of this attack. Wouldn't it have been obvious if it was the Nosalis instead of Dark Ones? Perhaps Hunter and co think Dark Ones are driving the Nosalis forward. Either way, the Dark Ones mean no harm. It makes sense that this realisation would only come about if Artyom has been inquisitive, by engaging in optional conversations with Khan and listening to speeches from communist leaders. If the morality system were only about being inquisitive, I'd be raving about it. Instead, much of the system involves familiar arbitrary choices such as give a bullet to a kid when he asks for it, rescuing prisoners, that kind of thing. You also get points for completely random stuff like responding promptly to Khan's instructions when he tells you to stay still, strumming a guitar or talking to people who have nothing of note to say. Ideally, the good ending would have been more closely linked to finding enough clues about the Dark Ones so that both Artyom and the player would know the Dark Ones weren't a threat. It would be tricky to pull off because if the player figured it out too early it would be frustrating to keep playing through the story when you know what you're doing is wrong. Perhaps getting nearly enough information to make a decision could trigger the appearance of a final clue at the end which helps you piece it all together. Even better would be if you only found the final clue after the missiles had been launched so the enlightened ending would be the same ending as the book. Artyom would have helped kill the Dark Ones but he would know about his mistake. I personally believe this is a much better way to end them with both Artyom and the player being completely clueless. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out in Last Light. In the enlightened ending, Artyom doesn't launch the missiles at all, so neither ending matches the book. Not to be confused with the Dark Ones, there's also the shadows that haunt certain metro tunnels. Khan explains that the shadows are souls of men who died in the tunnels while defending their station from attack. Through an incantation, Khan can make these shadows move out of the way, ensuring that Artyom can travel through the tunnel. Khan remains a bit of a mystery figure, but he's more fleshed out in the book. Khan is called Khan because he believes himself to be the literal reincarnation of Genghis Khan. He can also be as pretentious and annoying as you'd expect from someone who claims to be the reincarnation of Genghis Khan. He has a tendency to go off on philosophical rants which are usually tedious but occasionally interesting. 
For example, I appreciated his explanation of how time works in his metro station. Working clocks are rare, and while Exhibition had one, Khan Station did not. With no access to the surface, there was no way of telling or keeping time. Therefore, everyone had their own schedule. It might be night time for Khan, while it was morning for his roommate. It sounded stupid at first, but I had to admit it would be hard to come up with a decent solution short of building a clock, and it's not hard to imagine that no one in the station had that particular skill set. Speaking of time, Polis has a clock which has the Roman numeral for 6 where the Roman numeral for 4 should be. What is it with that one that gives people so much trouble? It's not surprising that a short and linear game has less detail than a book, but it's a touch disappointing. Much of the campaign consists of people dying while trying to help Artem in the next step of his journey. Without any character development, many of these faces become forgettable, and with the exception of Miller and Khan, I'm not convinced I'll recognise many returning faces in the sequel, despite playing the game multiple times. Artyom himself acknowledges this, wondering how many people are going to die for his mission and whether he is worth the trouble. On balance, if you're a fan of the game, I'd recommend reading or listening to the book as well. Artyom doesn't kill many people in the book, yet overall the journey is similar. Where characters and world building are concerned, the book doesn't contradict the game that often, so it's easy to keep the two consistent in your head. The book takes a few too many philosophical detours for my liking, and the author clearly has a bone to pick with the idea of religion. You could probably cut out 25% of the book and it'd be all the better for it. A bit like my videos, really. The game has its fair share of faults as well. The autosave system is a bit of a mess. It's usually good, however there are a couple of areas with huge gaps between checkpoints. In the chapter with the Reds and the Nazis facing off against each other, you trigger a checkpoint just by moving from the start and down a set of steps. After that, you don't trigger another checkpoint until you've made an awkward jump, killed a bunch of Nazis, climbed up the stairs, killed more Nazis, killed or snuck past a rail car, and then killed or snuck past another bunch of Nazis. If you're trying to remain undetected and you don't know about the secret route through the pipes, then this section can take a fair bit of time, and it's a pain to repeat if you're close to finishing when you die. Worst of all, the save states can trigger at some inopportune times. Once again, the best example I have is in the same Nazi vs Red section. The autosave triggered just as a grenade was coming towards me. I had to move as soon as the game started back up again or I would be instantly killed. Even when I did move straight away, I still managed to die or take damage a couple of times. 4A Games made a concerted attempt to mix up the pacing, with a consistent sprinkling of calm exploration, stealth sections and all-out combat. However, the pattern is so predictable that you know when these moments are coming and what form they're going to take. If I've been an hour without getting into a major fight, then I can expect to see a bunch of Masalis heading my way or maybe a turret section. Neither of these are particularly fun. Other than breaking up the pacing, the main purpose of these Nasalis encounters is to drain your ammo supply. This can be a touch frustrating because Nasalis seemingly take a random amount of shots to kill. I would get the odd one hit kill only for the next one to take four shotgun blasts to the face. Hit detection seems to be a little all over the place and your comrades chip in with a few shots so it's almost impossible to know how many shots you'll need to take them down. Furthermore, it's not always clear when the Nosalis is dead because they have a habit of ragdolling around both before and after death which leads to a few wasted bullets. The turret sections are typically terrible. These are rarely fun at the best of times and it's even worse here thanks to a terrible control scheme that, on controller at least, requires you to use one stick to move horizontally and another to move vertically. Our team is a silent protagonist with the exception of short journal entries that he reads out at the beginning of each new level. I'm not a big fan of silent protagonists because it often feels awkward. It's supposed to help you remain immersed, but then leads to immersion breaking situations where your character never talks despite it being obvious that he should. Our team's lack of voice is even jokingly referenced a few times. Welcome to Polis, Captain Krasnov. You've come a long way, young man. Where exactly are you from? He's from the exhibition. What, can't he speak for himself? While most of Metro 2033 looks incredible, especially in the Redux, the children look downright horrendous. Combine that with their clearly adult voices and you have a recipe for nightmares. Thankfully there aren't that many of them. My final complaint is that some of the later levels feel a touch disjointed compared to the rest of the game. When you're with Miller and his crew, you need to find a way for them to get a door open. Despite the environment being largely indestructible up until now, you're suddenly expected to realise that you can shoot open doors, destroy specific pieces of wood that are in the way, and even bring down a chandelier. During the climb up to the top of the tower, you can suddenly walk on thin railings as if they were solid metal, and climb tricky looking obstacles without any apparent difficulty. None of the problems I've discussed here need to put you off playing Metro 2033, it's a good game. There are a lot of good games out there demanding our time and money, but this one is relatively short, and more importantly, it does something a little different. It's tense and almost a horror game at times, but not one that relies on jump scares, which I hate, because I'm a coward. And that's it from me for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, I would appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. 
In the latest YouTube-related drama, it would appear that subscribing is not enough to guarantee you get notified about new videos. If you want to increase the chances of YouTube doing what it already should, then hit the bell icon and ask to be notified for all videos. I know it's a bit of extra faff, but getting views on new releases early doors really helps with the analytics. Plus, you can be one of those people who writes first in the comment sections. My next video really should be on Fallout 2. I know I've said that before, but I've put a lot of time into that game recently, and I don't foresee getting another video done before that one. The only exception is if I get an early review code and have a chance of hitting embargo like I did with the Devil May Cry collection. That's unlikely though. As always, the best way to stay up to date is through Twitter or Twitch. That's also the best place to ask me questions if you have any. I'm streaming Nino Kuni 2 at the moment, and after that it will probably be God of War. I also plan to stream Darksiders 2, Sleeping Dogs, Kingdom Hearts, and Detroit Become Human in the near future. Okay, thanks for watching. Cheers.